look, if I was looking at this and this was, I thought this weekend, basically the whole ball game is, is how are people going to react to the price dipping? Yeah. And we got the answer. The answer was they were buying the dips. Hello, everybody. GM, GM. I'm the host of Coinage. Zach Guzman well, coming to you live from our Brooklyn studios here in New York City alongside Nate Skid, yeah. Coinage producer extraordinaire. GM, sir. How you doing, man? Good, dude. It's exciting to be back. Uh, and Bitcoin is back as well as we're back above. Where are we at? Let's bring up the chart. Let's take a gander at where we are trading right now. Good North of 64. God. After a little bit of a scare, Nate, what dipping below. What 60 a week. K. It's a hell of a week. It's a hell of a bounce back. <laughs> Apparently, you- all it takes is one weekend to just recover from the woes and the spook and the scares. And on Friday, we saw every single Bitcoin ETF in the green, including Grayscale for the first time, basically, in forever. That feels like big news. It does seem like big news. Like they were calling it a Hall of Fame chart. Yes. Well, we might as well just bring it up. We might as well just get going into it because we were looking right at these numbers as it's kind of interesting to look at in terms of this idea of everyone being in the green for inflows, including Grayscale, which, again, as we said, basically has seen outflows every day. Uh, Texas, I wonder if we can bring up this tweet from Eric Balchunas over the Bloomberg boys uh, looking at basically the first time ever we've seen one day inflows all in the green, no red for any in the Bitcoin bunch. And that includes, Nate, you've probably seen their ads around the airport. (laughs) Uh, Grayscale had a net inflow of 63 million. Airport, subway, taxis. It's it's, It's wild how much um um communication they're getting out there about their about their product it's wild it went from like zero to everywhere yeah a lot of ads been from grayscale and i think that the reason do you think that had an impact i mean i think it did i also think that like that was kind of the point in terms of you know uh what they had to do to play catch up because i'm trying to bring up the other chart now because it was literally uh, basically they were getting their clocks cleaned in terms of everything that was happening if you have blackrock stepping in and basically taking over all the activity from all the boomers out yeah. there who want to play bitcoin this was this is the chart the Bitcoins and it's are hodlers, hodlers, this, huh? this is and how long that's the first green candle grayscale has seen in that 63 million in inflows that's uh wild. it's a wild chart it's every day bleeding and you know We'll also give a shout out to to the boomers here, Nate, because a lot of people, myself included, were basically saying, look, Bitcoin's now in a downtrend, right? When it dipped below 60K, it really started to look like that was going to be an ugly cycle because price falling behooves people to basically get out of these Bitcoin ETFs. The average, I think, purchase price was right around 57, 58 for all the money that had come in in the ETF. So like you're looking at basically, uh uh-oh, all my gains are gone. I might want to sell and get out. And not the case. Basically, you had people holding and saying, look, I'm going to get in now on Friday. Does this represent a a change to you? Like, do you think that this is going to kind of uh, um, bring more people in? I mean, I think, uh, look, if I was looking at this, and this was, I thought, this weekend, basically the whole ball game is is how are people going to react to the price dipping? Yep. And we got the answer. The answer was they were buying the dips through the ETFs. So and again, the ETFs you- aren't everything in Bitcoin, by the right. way. We should point that out because right. sometimes people focus too much on them now that they can be tracked so easily, I think. Right. But it is pretty good signal to see that type of bottoming and saying, look, yeah, we're in here for for kind of... You know, it, it feels like every time Bitcoin dips, it always comes back a little bit better. And so I'm wondering when the kind of, you know, um, uncertainty around it or any of the kind of like skepticism of it will kind of go away and people are just going to like really see it as an opportunity. Because, you know, buying the dip once or twice is one thing, but to me, it just feels like the the like the the a mass adoption is taking place where it's less seen as kind of like this like funky little vehicle and now it's becoming more of a permanent feature right <laughs> i like the term funky little vehicle by well, the way. I'm, I'm just saying like you know to a lot of people to 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 me included yes like, you know i'm not very comfortable with the idea of putting my very good hard-earned money um into something that's volatile or risky and i know that there's a huge upside but there's also this huge downside and the huge downside always outweighed the upside to me but like this just seems like there's a little bit more confidence it's becoming a little bit more stable and yeah. it feels like you know um 
it's going to become a permanent feature in the U.S. financial system, which is a completely different discussion. Than I think we you're had thinking. Well, I think you're saying. You know, I mean, U.S. financial system versus global financial system. Well, I think correct. you might be downplaying it a little okay. bit there, right, but right, right, but I would right. also say that that's kind of let's top line it just to wrap up our first segment before we move on to the others because there's a lot more to get to in terms of the SEC coming after Robinhood as well as a big bet uh, that Pantera that. made on Telegram's blockchain. But let's top line it because we've got this headline as well. Bernstein analysts doubling down on 150K uh, Bitcoin price prediction, Nate, basically essentially because of what you just said, yeah. which is a lot of people are realizing here that this kind of action, I think again, not to belabor the point, this weekend, seeing the trading action that we saw and also the fact that here we are with 11 Bitcoin uh, ETFs approved and also Hong Kong now potentially, not to dig too deep into that, but potentially seeing maybe Chinese access to some of those ETFs. There have been rumors that maybe ch Chinese mainlanders can start to maybe potentially see a door opening to play those if they want. That could be pretty interesting. That would be huge news, obviously. So there is potentially another catalyst on the horizon, if you believe those rumors. Well, Nothing it? huge to report there yet. I'm trying to go but back. that'd be pretty big. Sean Farrell predicted 125 on our show, and mm -hmm. we thought that was insane, right? You no, thought we, it was. I might have thought it was insane because I mean, Bitcoin was at like 40 at the time. Sure. Um, and now, like we have, <laughs> we have 150, and like nobody's batting an eye to it. I, it, I think that I'm gonna look back on the last couple of years as probably my biggest missed opportunity for intergenerational wealth transfer. I, yeah, my family. I mean, God I, damn it, I can't buy a house. I could have bought Bitcoin. I believe that. The, I mean, they said the same thing last time when we were talking about <laughs> Solana was you haven't missed the boat yet. And that was when it was sub 100. Now, you know, look at where that's at. Everyone always thinks they're too late. We're still early is what I will say. Uh, well, let's move on to the other one, though, because it wasn't just, I guess, Bitcoin itself. There are other ways, of course, to play crypto, including the big boys in Coinbase and uh, Block, Jack Dorsey's company. And a couple big notifications to come out of both those earnings, I think, Nate. Uh, I'm not sure which one is necessarily the better one to start with. I mean, they're both juicy, buddy. They're both juicy. They're both big. <laughs> I think um, if you look at Coinbase uh, um, in terms of their earnings, earnings. Uh, um, the stock didn't necessarily pop on Friday. It is green right now when we yeah. look at that. And, you know, the numbers are pretty good, I think, uh, across the board, even though maybe, you know, trading action as far as that name is concerned. That's wild because, like, Base is doing this with the SEC kind of still poking around, right? Like, aren't they still, like, mired in that uh, uh, a pretty big did they, get a, did they get a Wells? I mean, uh, they're in their huge battle right now with the SEC. That is definitely true. However, I will flag one thing when we look at the actual results um, in Coinbase's earnings in Texas. We can just bring up this bad boy over here um, because a lot of people are focusing on base, Nate, as we look at that. And I want to I want to make it clear here. The numbers aren't staggering by any means, especially when you think about the revenue numbers that Coinbase put up, $1.6 billion. So it was a 72% increase quarter on quarter. Mm -hmm. $1.6 billion is a lot bigger than what we're talking about on base, but it was the number one question from the earnings call. Everyone's saying, how profitable is base? What does that mean to Coinbase as a company? And where does it go? And they broke it out. Over the last 30 days, base has processed more transactions than any other layer two and handled twice the number of transactions processed by Ethereum itself. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to show you kind of like how far base has come. And then also, it's now looped into one part of their earnings that is basically $56 million in revenue for the quarter, which a large part of that was base's sequencer revenues. So basically yeah. anything that's now built on base, Coinbase is sitting there waiting to collect. And, you know, again, $56 million is not anywhere near the scope of the total first quarter revenues of $1.6 billion. But it does, I think, signal something that can scale beyond just Coinbase building it. It's everyone who's building on base. And that's, I mean, it's a long ways to go, obviously, but I think a lot of people are excited by what they've done with their Layer 2 already. Yeah, I just don't know what the ramifications of the SEC <laughs> portion of this is, is, is going to be. Um, because it's kind of like operating with this kind of umbrella over it, right? This kind of cloud. So I don't know. I, it's like, you know, it'll be interesting to me to see how it comes, like what happens as that um, investigation. Is it an investigation or well? It's, it's, a full on it's a full-on lawsuit. Full it's, it's a full-on full full trial, big, basically. Like it's a Mac Daddy. Yeah. I remember. Uh, I mean, I think it's really uh, both ways, and we're going to get into it with Robin Hood too, but I mean, it's literally both sides trying to hamstring the other. Um, whether it's through a Wells notice uh, right now with Robinhood, whether it's through the lawsuits, because it just mm -hmm. takes energy, it takes resources, it takes time 
uh, to actually battle the SEC. And but okay, energy time, but but like, what about the overall mire of like this? entire project might not be able to continue as it is today yeah i mean that's obviously huge if you think Should we about not ask questions that big i mean is that too existential not in the case of coinbase they're going after them for being an unregistered exchange and the idea of is eth a security i mean there's a lot of things out there that that could become hugely problematic for the industry as a whole and coinbase as a company but well, I mean, until it looking, happens you've I, just got the same thing and i'm not saying it's the same thing at all i'm just saying like doquan sbf now CZ, and I'm not saying anything about base. I'm not saying anything. It's all a little, whatever. But I'm just saying that, like, you know, these things are, are odd to me because they operate as if nothing is happening underneath the surface. Yet underneath the surface, there are, like, questions about, you know, will this project continue to exist? And so, I don't know. To me, it's, like, one of those things. I'm a, I'm a normie. I'm, I'm definitely not a degen. Um, but I just kind of look at the overall health. And there's a lot of interesting things that can happen. But, like, if there's a fundamental or foundational question, that just kind of goes to me to be a little bit, I don't know. It's a I little think scary could, to me. Maybe, make, I'm, maybe I'm, like, um, a little hyperbolic on it. Just use a little... Ah. I think you can make the same positive spin on it, too, which is if this company comes out on the other side as basically battle tested for sure and being the only one that is compl seemingly compliant if they win. Sure. Uh, and like you said, everything else is basically crumbled and or, you know, down. People make the same case about Binance, by the way, too. So it's unclear exactly yeah. how how much of a lead uh, Coinbase will have on the other side. But. We'll like see. maybe this isn't a maybe there isn't a, a, a strong connection between the two, but in my little simple brain there is because we're looking at grayscale and we're looking at the eleven Bitcoin ETFs that all did well, you know, and that couldn't have happened without Bitcoin going through what it went through, right? To sure. Be, to, to to be greenlit, and so like the same could be said for base, right? Whereas like coming out of the other end after it goes through this litmus test, then it could like reach its full potential. It's just until then, it just feels weird that, um, you know, there's this underlying uncertainty over a company as big and well-known and as kind of popular as base. Well, two points. You made one Sorry. that you made one that Coinbase, um, you know, being the custodian for the ETH ETFs, large majority of the ETH ETFs, that was also a big contributor in terms of uh, performance in the quarter. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing for them. I suspect that lead will be maintained. Despite the fact that companies like BitGo and others are trying to, you know, stick their nose in there and maybe steal some custodian share away from Coinbase. And then the other thing you mentioned in terms of, uh, I guess, you know, the SEC coming after them. Uh, let's shift over to Block because that was another name. And sure. I think it was interesting to think about their earnings and what came out of that. Because Block certainly not as big of a company. But Texas, we've got this other headline. And I think it was kind of an interesting maybe perhaps reason, shall we say, if you want to drink the, the Kool-Aid here, Nate's kid. Mm -hmm. um, Jack Dorsey came out and said that they're going to be investing 10% of their Bitcoin profits, not the entire company's profits, but just Bitcoin profits, into purchasing Bitcoin. So taking a page, maybe perhaps, obviously they've already been doing this, Block holds almost half a billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. But kind of taking a page out of Michael Saylor's book in that not only are they doing that as a company, but they also wanted to publish a playbook for other companies to emulate what they're doing now uh, to essentially open the door for other companies to scoop up Bitcoin in a way that maybe they feel a little bit more protected, like uh, they're doing exactly what Jack Dorsey is doing. I mean, and I think if you square that potentially yeah. with maybe getting called out for potentially why do having to terrorists to use crypto on <laughs> Block's platform, they said that they take that seriously and they're working to, you know. I guess, fight back in those allegations. I think it's interesting, Nate, to pair those things and say maybe they brought too much attention upon themselves by trying to basically open the door for other companies to be Yeah, I just don't understand why they would... It, it's, it's not that I don't understand why they would do that. It's just like, man, there is no, like chill <laughs> you know what i mean there's no just like just do your own thing just don't raise any red flags don't you know cause a lot of attention or commotion but like i would actually say it's funny because block maybe isn't as well known by its new name but as square i think it is right yeah because like square is fucking massive is it not square is big i mean yeah i mean uh, the, the revenue here in terms of the company uh was almost six billion dollars 22% jump in gross profits over a one year period. But Jack is a so, home, Jack, Jack is a homeboy for 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 Bitcoin though, isn't he? Like yeah. I mean, this guy really believes in the project. And it's really interesting to me that when you start to think about 
um, his influence and the people that follow him. It's just wild, man. Like the, the guy really does believe in the project and I, and he's a, such a smart guy. And I, I wonder if, um, like what this is going to mean in the future. Like, I feel like he has plans. I should be clear too. Uh, you know, I, I think maybe I said the sec, but it's not exactly the sec that's going after him. It was federal prosecutors looking at compliance lapses at block. So oh, just to no be clear, deal. uh, no slightly different, uh, interests there. Um, but no, you're right. I mean, like, he's another one of the Bitcoin boys. Maybe it's a good segue into what's going on in Ethereum because you got Michael Saylor, you got Jack Dorsey, you got, I guess I was going to say Elon Musk, but he's more of a doge boy. You've got a lot of big name people who are all about Bitcoin. Maybe not so much on the Ethereum side. And that is interesting to get into, Nate, as we've seen potentially, basically, for the first time in almost a year, gas fees on Ethereum basically tanking to one year lows. Um, because everyone's using L2s, not a lot of stuff going on on ETH mainnet. And this chart's pretty interesting just in terms of burned ETH after the London Fork upgrade. Essentially, that one was all built around Ethereum getting burned the more it was used. Now the Ethereum network basically not as congested because of all these other layer twos out there. Now you got a lot of ETH not getting burned because of that. And now flipping to being an inflationary asset, which in crypto is kind of not great. <laughs> kind of not the <laughs> kind norm. Of not good. Yeah, that's not exactly the way it's supposed to go. So what is this? Is this a? Uh, is this just an oversight? Is this um, something that they missed, or is this kind of a, a, a feature? I call a it. Bug? I would call it an unintended consequence. Perhaps, maybe, is how I would phrase it. Yeah, but what, what do you think is going to be the 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 effect of that? I mean, it's 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 Bitcoin and Ethereum, and then there's everything else. And I think that any bad news on Ethereum has to be good news for Bitcoin, no? Well, or I mean, I, I think we Am I not thinking about it as, like, is this like Coke and Pepsi? I think it's just a very you know? strange, it's a strange time right now for Ethereum. And my point being was that there's no one, you know, outside of Vitalik, I suppose. Um, like, who are the Ethereum boys? Maybe outside of Bankless. Who are the, the whole, Ethereum boys? I, the whole point? That you don't need that a cheerleader? Need yes, that, yeah. perhaps. But it's also like, okay, here we are. We've got the SEC saying no ETH ETF, right? So that one's out of the bag. Now you've got Ethereum gas fees basically going bunk. And you got uh, it being inflationary for the first time in a year. It's just like, what? what's going on? It just, Where's the momentum? It just feels like, it just feels like the, there's going to be one. Yeah, and, and again, I, I, and I don't, I, you know, again, I'm not, um, I'm not anti or negative or down on on crypto necessarily. It just feels like, you know, um, in a free market or in a marketplace, like people are going to move to where they they feel the most safe, the most comfortable. There's less volatility, and it just feels like with the ETFs getting greenlit and everything, everything is moving into Bitcoin now. The big, the big thing will be if one of these. Um, like social apps or one of these like, you know, um, international like WhatsApp, Telegram, whatever, and I think we're going to get into it in a little bit, can kind of unlock something within that where you have a mass of people that are already in an ecosystem <laughs> and then something just kind of gets unlocked. That feels really smart. And I remember somebody in an interview one time saying something very um, eye-opening about like what could potentially happen if a major social network, say, um, got into its own kind of native token or something and then unlocked a marketplace thing. You know, it's an interesting segue, Nate, because that's exactly what Pantera's thesis is in terms of Telegram's oh, ton. Like uh, the next one that we're digging into here is where Pantera's it really doubled down, I think, a little bit on this. Um, Texas, if we want to bring that one up, it's it's Pantera's new blog post from last week, um, digging into why they're putting money into Ton, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting. I mean, like, this is one where it's a company as huge as Telegram. They've basically got almost a billion users, monthly active users, in terms of where they're at. And, I mean, look at this chart. It's like they're up there with some of the largest, I'll zoom in a little bit, monthly downloads. Yeah, you're up there with some of the largest names in tech. And Telegram tried to launch this coin back in 2019. They, too, got hit with a uh, warning from the SEC saying, look, that's an unregistered security. Did that happen to a Libra, too? Or did I mean, Libra just dissolve on its own like the metaverse? Yeah, Facebook really tried to get theirs out there. <laughs> but, you know, see how that went. That was for a stable coin. I should oh, make the okay. note oh, that this is right. slightly right. different okay. in, in what Telegram's trying to do. And it is interesting because, to your point, you've already got a massive ecosystem. If they have actually been able to do this, and now you got Pantera betting on them by investing in Ton. Mm -hmm. um, out of Dubai, I was chatting with a company building on Ton in the way that, you know, 
they've got all these users. What can you do with them? How do you scale that? What do you want to do with it? And we chatted with Tom Kopira from Olympics. He's their COO. And he was kind of explaining how this would all work. When you use a blockchain, you can start to enable the transfer of money through games. I don't know how real this is. We're going to play his clip because I'm not a huge gamer. But their idea of basically, just like you would play games in iMessage, do it in Telegram and let people bet. Take a listen to how he explained it. Think of it this way, like we set up the chat, like a group chat for our friends on Telegram, okay? And we invite our bot and we set up, okay, let's have a competition now, like for one hour or for one day, let's say, okay? Anyone can join. We set up like $1 as a participation mm -hmm. fee. And everyone who joined the chat can easily initiate the game. And we try to outperform each other. And trial after trial, the price pool grows, right? And in the end, you, you might have like 1K to win, right? And people are outperforming each other. So this is the type of the experience that we are bringing also with the single player games like the Flappy Bird is. So, I mean, there you go, Nate. You got people who are playing games, you got people who are betting on these games, and you've got the ability for a lot of users to basically create wallets, not having to deal with seed phrases, just basically using their Telegram account. And that is the thesis behind Pantera's big bet here and wanting to scoop up a little bit of the action. Um, but yeah, I think it's a an couple of red flags, maybe just, 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 just a couple. I might bring up one. Mm -hmm. I think there was a, a gaming company. Was it called Axie Infinity? Was Axie Infinity the one where like it started as a thing, a game where you could actually earn, and then people turned that into a job, and then there were like farms of people that were just playing the game because their lives depended upon it, and then it wasn't so fun. Yeah, I mean, but that's play to earn. And this is more of just like straight up, I guess it's similar to play to earn, but there's not a token that could crumble in the same way. Well, there's not a token that could crumble in the same way, but there could be poor young children in some other country that are like forced to beat these, you know, people in these games so that they could generate revenue to feed their families. Like yeah. anytime you introduce a kind of like financial incentive to be on an app, I think that there's going to be issues with that. And I think that there's a reason why some of these laws were put in place against gambling, even sports gambling. It's like, I don't, I'm not necessarily a huge fan of watching, you know, a sport with like all of the different, you know, parlays and shit kind of like always coming up. And so I, I like the idea of, Hey, this could be really fun. Like a, a little group of your friends and you could bet a couple bucks and to see who's the best. I just think that if you play that scenario out, it ends up with like farms of children playing these games, trying to earn X amount so that they can like feed their families. It could, but it also could enable just in general, maybe people who aren't doing it for that, just to have kind of fun interactions back and forth. And also just the way to basically send money. Well, social media, fa Facebook started as a way just for you to communicate with your friends and all of a sudden it destabilized every democracy in the world. So like <laughs> these things can start off with good intentions and then kind of like unravel over time. Sure. Now, like the bigger play, in my opinion, is, you know, you look at you look at things like Facebook Marketplace. You look at like Instagram and the ability to order directly from Instagram. Um, and you could start to see if one of these companies could unlock a – um, internal token or something like that that maybe had a couple more safeguards than just like pure, yeah. you know, self custody, whatever. I'm just saying, like, that could be really interesting. I mean, it's the ultimate race. I think that that's, I mean, obviously, we were talking about this before Elon Musk and what he's trying to do with X and the idea the of using Dogecoin, that's it sounds like, play. as the token versus what's happening with Ton and the idea of their own token. I don't think there's a lot of companies at Telegram scale who could actually get this done in the way that they did, get a token out there and now have both. Because Facebook tried to do it, shut down. Look, man. Look. Can X pull it off? I don't know. Maybe they can. We've conducted hundreds of interviews by this point. Would you say hundreds? Hundreds. Yes. One, of the, one of the most eye-popping things that I had heard was from, was from Caitlin um, Long. And she said that, you know, Elon buying Twitter at the time wasn't about buying Twitter. It was about unlocking what could be the, the potential for introducing Doge and a token into Twitter and then seeing what could happen with that. Now, I guess if, if, if Elon was the largest holder of Dogecoin, there'd be a little bit more truth to that. But, you know, I don't know if that's the case. Is that the case, does he? It's kind of floated out there that, yes, that is the case. Um, so, in so the, But in the ranked list of, 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 of apps that you just showed. But would you buy Dogecoin, then? That's the thing. Like, if that's the plan, since look, Caitlin said that, you, and since it's clear to us, the, would you, you buy you, it? You bet on the jockey, not the horse. 
And mm. like, I know a lot of people are down on Elon and I'm not saying that he didn't go a little crazy on X recently. It's a little odd. But the dude is sending things into space. He's digging a tunnel. Yeah, under so would LA. you buy Bitcoin though? or sorry, Dogecoin? If if based if, on if, that thesis, if I yes, probably. Okay. If there was movement that showed that he was moving in that direction, I think a lot of people would be just like me to say, "Listen, I don't know about Pantera or Tan or any of this other shit, but I do know about Elon, and he he has he's a very." It's, I think that there would be a certain amount of confidence people would have that if he was the guy that was behind the project and he had a plan for it, I feel like people would buy into it. And I feel like maybe I would do the same. Mm. Uh, I just think that of all of the stuff that I have heard, all the projects that I've heard, all the interviews that we've had and all the price calls or whatever. Sure. Elon introducing crypto into X is fucking interesting. And it, if that were to happen, I think that would be one of the biggest things that could happen for mass market adoption of crypto and globally, period. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, I, I think that's the same kind of thesis and, and bet that Pantera is making right now on Telegram and Ton. But, I mean, looking at the chart for Dogecoin here, up 106% in Wait, the last Texas, year. Texas, so, bring that up. Look at this. so there you go. I mean, what, potentially what? maybe other people also sticking around. And it's a good segue, I think, Nate, into our last point because a lot of people bought Dogecoin and experienced Dogecoin, if you recall – Back in the pandemic, when maybe after the SNL visit, kind of that's that was the huge dip in all of this. If you mm-hmm. got to go back a little bit longer to include that, um, because it has not reached the peak SNL Elon Musk Doge father uh, hubba baloo, if I'm using that word. Correctly. Look what happened with one. That was one piece of media content. Yeah, well, there's a, a lot sustained. going on back there. I'm you not gonna put. I'm not gonna put it all on SNL. Was. That's not what that was. But yes, there's a lot going on I'm back just there. Saying that. I'm just saying that there there are certain people and like he owns a lot of the right things like to own the platform to be the largest holder of Doge to just be sitting on it to let all of these other companies kind of go through the SEC go through the courts go through the investigations kind of see what shakes out and then after all of that is done be the guy that could that could <laughs> unlock it. It's but what's interesting is that everyone's basically looking at the internet native currency and that's like kind of the everything that is happening right now with Bitcoin and same thing with Dogecoin, same thing with Tom we just talked about. Everyone wants to be kind of the currency that's used on the and I don't think you can have that many currencies that are used on the internet because what's the main difference between all of them? And like yeah, you said, if, if, if it's just like platform specific, then every one of these platforms is going to have their own kind of native weird. U.S. Fucking weird. native currency. But what if, what if, what if all the holdings were actually in Bitcoin and then the token was just in Doge? So like the, the, it, cause in, 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 in my stupid little brain, Bitcoin ends up being the only one that's the internet native currency or whatever you just said. And then there could be like the X coin that's like actually like, like the, where the, the, the foundation of it is actually Bitcoin. Is that stupid? No, I mean, there's plenty of stable coins that are basically set up similar to that. Yeah. But what I'm saying though, is like, if you could, if you could transact on a native token in a platform like X, Knowing that you weren't just buying the token, your money wasn't because it wasn't wasn't actually in Doge, but the, but Doge was backed by Bitcoin. That's really interesting. And like, if there were certain ways in which you could use that token in an X ecosystem, like that could be. I'm just saying, man. Like the way that like that he's monetizing ads. No, for sure. I mean, it's content, clear. It's like clear. It just makes a lot of sense. It's clear that he's definitely moving in that direction. It's just that we sorry, haven't seen that much. Talking. We haven't seen that much since we covered it with Caitlin in terms of, I guess, the progress. And you're right. He's sitting there and watching all these other platforms also go through the process and get their own dings. That's the one that we're ending on today because it basically just happened. Looking at the SEC coming after Robinhood issuing another Wells notice, man. They've been on a tear with all these warnings. And it's worth pointing out, a Wells notice doesn't mean that you've done anything wrong. It's basically an opportunity for you to come out and say, hey, we didn't do anything wrong before it gets serious. <laughs> I love that. It's an opportunity. <laughs> right. It's an opportunity. Seize the, seize the day. Yeah. Robin Hood stock was off by about 2% after this came out. It's battled back into the green, Nate. But, I mean, this is another one in its crosshairs in terms of how many Wells notices we've seen the SEC come out with. But what did it do? Now Robin Hood getting a ding. What did it do this time? I guess we'll find out. Jesus, man. Robin Hood is a weird one too, you know? Robin Hood, I want to love it. A lot of people did. I want to love it. I just, I don't know. I just, something about, something about, something about the way that they make money, it just feels like they're preying on people's, um, 
kind of ignorance on what it is to like actually make money doing trading the way that they they want. Yeah, I no, it's a, I mean, it's a, obviously it's a, it's a big company and a lot of people, as I said, experience crypto, my mom included, by the way, through Robinhood and trading on Robinhood. And that is the target of this Wells notice. I'll just Your read the statement. A DJ? Someone's got to, someone's got to teach Mama her. Goose? I'll teach no, anyone who wants to learn. And you know what? God willing, uh, Texas, let's just bring up this, this real quick that's statement so from them in terms of what Robinhood's saying about all this. After years of good faith attempts to work with the SEC for regulatory clarity, including a well-known attempt to come in and register. We're disappointed that the agency has decided to issue a Wells notice relating to our U.S. crypto business. Um, that's from their chief legal compliance corporate affairs officer. So, I mean, we're going to see what happens here, but this is just kind of, again, the same exact cycle that we've seen from the SEC in terms of Wells notice to a company that is onboarding a lot of people into yeah. crypto. Again, the war continues. Yeah. Well, you know, what's weird is, um, you know, we uh, I think last year we were talking a little bit about crypto politics and is this going to be the crypto election? And, um, you know, RFK Jr. is s hanging around, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I, I, I thought that I didn't think that he would he would be um, he would last as long as he has. And he is he is he making any impact? Do you think like do you think that so you have a lot of SEC action? Mm -hmm. You have a lot of, I think interest in regulating crypto or at least regulating it to the point where it's not quite as prevalent as it is and then you have like one of the candidates that just won't go away who's like probably the most pro crypto candidate mm -hmm. so far i mean in a certain sense although when i was at ETH denver and I asked him about ethereum he kind of just you know lack of a better term just shat the bet on that one he, he's like i don't want to accept it i haven't yet i'll have my That's team right. look into it he didn't really do yeah, anything but is there that dumb? like i mean considering the problems that eth is having now is that dumb i don't know maybe maybe not but we did ask our our followers this was a poll that we had brought up in terms of which ones out of the candidates that exist right now is uh basically gaining the most support among crypto users nate's kid trump's still in the lead rfk jr to your point not going away and biden there in last shape as you know she's seen or he's seen kind of in the same camp as Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren's anti-crypto army. Um, so that's yeah. kind of the shakeout. Again, these aren't scientific results, only 151 votes. But I think it was an interesting idea from Ryan Selkis to get an early poll on, <laughs> well, hey, I how, much how are we that, doing I, up there? I wonder how much of that is just from the fact that Trump launched an NFT PFP collection. Could be of terrible artwork. Could be. Could be. I, I don't know. Could be also that like kind of the other Republican support now coming out in favor of crypto, the pendulum swings back. You know, a lot of people are, if you listen to Ryan Selkis, one issue voters in crypto. And it's yeah. a big deal for kind of the onslaught, as we just said. It is a war right now. And that war goes away if you have someone who's not as anti-crypto as Gary Gensler is in that seat. So well, that's very true. All quite interesting to watch. And those are the headlines we watched over the past couple of days, over the weekend. Bitcoin back, Nate Skid, as we we're going to see how this week goes Kind of interesting to see, I think, the overall market kind of bounce back. I feel like Bitcoin's not back. It's just here to stay. Hey, oh, we made a man. We made a Bitcoin man here. If we've done nothing else, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, the show mean, will it's, end it's, when Nate's kid buys Bitcoin. That's when it's going to be over. It's but. The, the, the one coin to rule them all. I just I just feel like that's going to be the one. I, I, I'm telling you guys. I'm, well, I'm not telling you guys because I really don't know. But I, keep an eye on Doge. Keep an eye on X. I, I just think that Elon could unleash something wild. And um, I, 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 I don't know, man. That one wouldn't be too weird for me, but that could be a big deal if it happens. We'll see where it goes. Right now, Dogecoin basically keeping pace with Bitcoin in terms of the gains over the last year. Dogecoin has done nothing. Like, that is so bizarre. Just, I think it's a good I'm one. not alone in this thought. <laughs> yeah, if you agree with Nate's kid, comment on this, and no we'll see doubt. if anyone I'm, out there you, is I'm also watch, in the Doge camp. Watch. Uh, that's going to do it for us this time around on Coinage's News Digest. For Nate Skid, for myself and everybody here at Coinage, thank you again for watching. You can head to coinage.media to check out the latest headlines in crypto and co-own the project with us. Good to do it, man. Dude, thanks for enlightening me. Diamond Good hand. to do it. Diamond hands, everybody. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you again soon. <laughs>